better feeling in the world. He knows he's won. It's all over by the handshake. Stephen Hendry's five-year reign as world champion is over. Ken Doherty is world champion for the first time. Doherty wins by 18 frames to 12. It's a great day for the Irish. Sheffield and the Crucible Theatre belongs to Ken Doherty, who beat Stephen Hendry 18-12 to become the 1997 Embassy World Champion. And so it was. All the more so because when the first ball of the 1997 Embassy World Championship was struck 17 days earlier, no one really considered that it might be Ken Doherty striking the last. Not even you, Ken. No, certainly not. Uh, going into the World Championships, I certainly wasn't looking like a contender. I'd been beaten in a, a couple of first round matches, especially in the Irish Masters, to Steve, where I got a trounce, and then uh, went out in the first round of the British Open. So. You know, the confidence wasn't too high going into the World Championships, but then, you know, everything sort of changed and, you know, fell nicely into place for me, which can sometimes happen. Were you satisfied with your form up to the World Championship? Going into uh, Sheffield, I, I was happy the way I was playing in practice, but that counts for nothing because you've got to do it in the matches. But uh, certainly by just getting the head down and working a lot harder and getting up earlier and, and seeing, uh, you know, hear, hearing the birds singing in the morning was a, a new experience for me, but... Uh, it was, uh, it was a nice experience and uh, certainly if I've learnt anything from the World Championships it's, uh, you know, it's, it's doing the right thing, treating it as a job and, and treating the game with respect as well as, well as myself. So you've practised hard, the draw's been made and you've drawn Mark Davis. What did you think of that? It wasn't a very, very good draw for me. I, I, I didn't think it was an easy draw for me by any standard because Mark Davis had uh, beat me a couple of years ago in the first round in Sheffield as well. He's a very, very good player and uh, it was a tough first round and to be perfectly honest, when, when the draw came out, I wasn't looking beyond Mark Davis. I was just going to Sheffield and just concentrating on beating Mark Davis. I had no sort of uh, aspirations of, of winning the World Championship. I was just worrying about the first match and, and taking each match as it came after that. And, uh, you know, it, it pr proved to be a very, very tough game. Hit. Well, nothing simple in the World Championship at this stage in a match but uh, surely Ken couldn't ask for an easier chance and I think young Mark Davis 11. has probably just had the edge on the running this evening but when he needed it most in this frame it deserted him and uh, went Ken's way and on such fractions I say the matches depend Played exceptionally well, Mark Davis, but it could be a very relieved 20. Ken Doherty that sees this pink disappear and uh, into the next round for a possible match with Steve Davis. Or Ken Doherty wins. He didn't have much to spare there. He kept with me and never let me get away. I never sort of flinched under the pressure, and it was only a little bit of luck in the, in the last frame uh, where I sort of fluked the snooker. Uh, and he missed it and then knocked it over, the, knocked the red over the hole that, that allowed me to, to go on and win the match. Uh, and I think that's when sort of Lady Luck sort of shined on me a little. And it's probably what I needed, a little break here and there. And uh, certainly the look of the Irish was on my side that day. Anyway, you did win 10-8 and your next opponent is Steve Davis. What were your thoughts going into that match? Well, as I said before, you know, I was just concentrating on the first match and, and, and once I got over Mark Davis, I think I had about five or six days uh, between the two matches. Uh, so I was very much relieved to, to get over that match and felt I was involved in the tournament then. Uh, certainly the last thing anybody wants to do at Sheffield is to go out in the first round. But to, to, to play the best of 25 against Steve, I was, I was sort of relishing it. But not as much as I would have before because he'd beat me 6-1 both times the last the, the previous two times we played so I was I think I was more determined against Steve this time I wanted to show that I, you know I was able to play him and I, although I'd beaten him many times before I, you know when you've got trounced 6-1 six, 6-1 one, six, one, you know you're a little bit sort of apprehensive uh, but at the same time I was really looking forward to playing him and uh, I wanted to go out and prove a point Doherty got the good start he needed 83-0 and the first frame in the bag here's the second frame
not a good break off from Steve Davis. Nine. Nicely putting the red 16. on for the left corner. But I don't think he can hold for the black. Seventeen. If Ken is straight enough on the blue, he may hold for the one loose red. Obviously wasn't. 22. But if the red goes for the left corner, that's very good indeed. Just looks to be touching the other red, so the path is blocked off. Twenty-three. Candoti, twenty-three. is not uh, straightforward for Steve. He can't come off a couple of cushions and just nestle onto a red. He would be leaving certainly uh, something easy on, so he may attempt a two cushion escape where he comes off the side and top cushion and glances off a red to try and get the white back down the table. He's looking at the possibility of coming twice across the table to land on the red that's to the left of the black. But if he doesn't get this right, he'll leave the one on for the right corner. Foul and a miss. Gandorti, four. Well, if Ken can't get through to the red, this nearest the right corner pocket... Uh, this is not as straightforward. If he could get to that one as near as the pocket and pot it, he would free the black into the same pocket. But obviously he can't get through to the second red. 
one. So the black looks as if it may be covered into both corner pockets. Taking the opportunity of moving one of them. Seven. Ken will be on the black this time. Twelve. And I'm sure we'll see him play for the red to the left of it to then have the black free for both corner pockets. Nineteen. Twenty. Just flicked onto the two reds that were touching. I think both of them probably go now. He has another one just to the left of that, which also goes, so spoilt for choice. 28. And Steve still hasn't potted a ball in this match 35. yet. Apart from the cue ball, that is. 36. And there's the amount of points that uh, Ken Doherty has amassed, 134. Without a reply from Steve Davis. Forty-three. Best of twenty-five frames, so you won't be too concerned yet. Forty-four. But Ken Doherty looks very relaxed here. He's back living in his native Dublin. He's had a championship table installed 49. over there, so... Got the same conditions to practice on. 50. And that means Ken... 55 could make a possible 106 clearance here if he took three reds and blacks in all the colours. 56. Absolute dream start for Ken Doherty. 63. Seventy-one. 
77. 91. 97. 105. That was a beautiful break from Ken Doherty. Magnificent break of 104. That puts him two frames to nil in front. 2-0 became 5-0 and that became victory at 13-3 with a session to spare. It's always good to get a good start, but was it even more important to get a good start against Steve so that you didn't get enmeshed in a tactical battle? Exactly. Well, that's some, sometimes the case when you play Steve. I think if you get enmeshed, as you say, you know, the, the frames are dragged out. Whereas I got, I got a, uh, a great start against him. And because of that, he was, he was playing catch-up, so he had to take more chances. And because he was... A few frames behind, he was taking more chances, than, and it wasn't sort of his game, and it sort of fell into my hands. And and uh, when he was taking the chances on, he was he was missing and leaving me in, and I was just capitalising on them. You're only in the quarterfinals, but you're playing well. Are you starting to think world title? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think I was I was just taking one match at a time. I knew the next match coming up against John Higgins, uh, who I hadn't beaten before in, in the previous four meetings. Uh, that was also going to be a very very tough match, no matter how well I was playing. But certainly after beating Steve uh, with a session to spare, uh, was you know was a major feather in my cap, and and you know I was I was so so happy the way I was playing. Uh, I was walking around Sheffield, you know, a few inches taller. It was it was a fantastic feeling, and uh, but more importantly, I think I was more focused than than in any other tournament I ever played in. I think I was I was getting away. I was doing my own thing, not getting involved in the carnival atmosphere, the circus of, of the World Championships, which sometimes can happen. And uh, I was, you know, doing my own thing at the hotel and, and spending a lot more time on my own and, and sort of realising that this was a job that had to be done and try and give it 100% and, uh, and not be wavered by, uh, you know, other people or, or, or the, the atmosphere of it all. John Higgins had been having some trouble with his cue. Did you think much about this before you played? No, not at all, because he, he played uh, pretty well in, in his first two matches himself and, and, and won pretty comfortably. So... Uh, you know, again, it, it was another sort of tough match and another sort of bridge I had to cross because I hadn't beaten John Higgins before. And uh, I know he'd mentioned it in his interview a few times. And uh, and I knew he, he was sort of very, very confident of beating me, no matter how well he was playing or how bad he was playing. Because, and even with his cue problems, he still was pretty confident to beat me. So, you know, it was another, as I said, another bridge to cross, another sort of... Uh, I had to dig very sort of deeply to, to, to sort of to get the confidence to, to overcome that. Like I wasn't really worried because I, no matter you know if you're a good player and if you're in the top eight or you're in the top four, if somebody beats you four or five times, you're not going to be bothered about it. I know it's going to be a little bit in the back of your mind, but you know, like on your day, you're good enough to beat anybody. And if I can beat Stephen Hendry, uh, you know, I can certainly beat John Higgins or, or any of the other top players. And uh, certainly, I wasn't worried about it as other people might have been, but. I knew it was still a, a, something that I, I hadn't achieved and wanted to achieve it. And uh, to get over that match was uh, was another feather. I was I was picking up feathers. I was going along. I was like an Indian by the time the tournament finished. Doherty trailed three nil, but after two of the three sessions, he led nine seven. He improved that to eleven eight, but Higgins reduced this to eleven nine. The twenty first frame was to decide whether Higgins would get right back into contention at eleven ten or whether Doherty would go three up with four to play. We join it with the frame approaching its climax. Yes, at the moment I think both players are showing signs of pressure. Ken doing a lot of studying, but I don't think there's any doubt he's got to take this red on. Well, it looks like he's playing the safety. (coughs) 
Well, John was looking at the reds to the right of the pink, but they're, they're definitely not a plant. So a safety shot coming up. Applause, but John Higgins held his hand up to Ken Doherty and apologised. He didn't intend to cut that one in. But what a timely fluke for John Higgins. Not very timely for Ken Doherty, though. Yes, and that looks absolutely spot on. Four. Five. And of course, moving that red opens the path up for that bottom red into the right corner. John Higgins, 12. Well, it's just amazing what the uh, crucible nerves can do to even two seasoned professionals like this. John didn't get ideal position. But he still shouldn't have missed that. Difficult shot to play, but now chance to get right back into this frame. Six. Still got to be a little bit careful though with the positional side of this shot. He wants to drop on the blue or pink nicely. Well, he's heading Seven. on up the table but he had quite a margin of error. Just means now that he's got a little bit further to go with the cue ball to get back into prime position. But he needs one good positional shot to make things much easier for himself. Ten. Yes, now decision time. Pink or black after this red? Eleven. Yes, and Ken giving this everything he's got. You can see it's a frame winning chance. Eighteen. Nineteen. <coughs> now just screw back for the red into the right corner. And that opens up the other two. 26. <coughs> yes, he'll be very anxious again. 25. 
27. He knows that there's not a ball on the table safe. It would have to be a careless mistake from Ken. Yes, and I don't know. I just can't see that happening at this moment. Ken 34. looks... We've got his confidence back. Thirty-five. <coughs> It'll be down for the blue or one of the bulk colours. Forty-one. This last red. Forty-two. We may have to go in and out of box to get nicely onto the yellow. So we'll be screwing the white just over the brown spot and back up again. Well, he could hold it. Looked as if he didn't have that angle, but it's absolutely 47. perfect now. 49. Just the green and brown required. <coughs> 52. 56. Yes, it was John Higgins who had a great chance in this frame, but uh, he let that slip away. 61. And it'll be a somewhat relieved Ken Doherty because he was looking a little bit nervy in the frame before the mid-session interval, but this will help him to relax. 67. That was an excellent break of 67 from Ken Doherty. That puts him into the lead. 12 frames to 9. He only needs one. That clearance broke Higgins's resistance. A break of 116, 116. by Doherty in the next frame made him a 13-9 winner and a semi-finalist. You expected a hard match, and it was quite hard, but was it quite as hard as you expected? As the game wore on, I was starting to build up confidence and, and starting to play uh, something similar the way I didn't sort of reach the peak as what I did against Steve but I certainly you know uh, you know up and I had my highs and lows in the match but certainly to come out in the end after that turning point to go 12-9 up uh, was was very very important and I felt very relaxed after that and, and it was a great victory for me I think what the both of us wanted to do because you're in the quarterfinals you're looking at a semi-final spot and, and, the, and the chance to play on the one table venue uh, where the one table comes into to operation and I, I think that's what we both aspired to to play in and see exactly what it was like because the one table is is almost like playing in the final anyway and uh, to sort of to witness that sort of atmosphere uh, was something that we both wanted to achieve it wasn't the fact of uh, you know the semi-final of the world championship but it was just the fact of playing at Sheffield with the one table and, and, and trying to see what it was like for for Stephen and Steve Davis and Alex Higgins before them, and see what what they what sort of what Sheffield and what the World Championships was all about, and uh, I, I, was, I was just incredible that to get over that line and and, and realise that that was going to come true was uh, I was jumping around all over the place. <laughs> You're the first Republic of Ireland player ever to reach the semi-finals. You're the first Irishman since Dennis Taylor in 1985 when he went on to beat Steve Davis for the title. The pressure's starting to build up. Are you sleeping all right at night? I was, I was sleeping great, to be honest. Uh, much better than I'd been before. I felt, as I said, I felt a lot more relaxed now. Uh, I'd come over uh, you know, three very tough matches uh, against three very good players. And you know, my, my confidence was escalating uh, as, as the days were going on. You know the realizations were starting to set in, but I wasn't. As I said before, I wasn't like trying to let that bother me. I was trying to get away and do my own thing, and not sort of be around Sheffield or the Crucible uh, only for my matches. 
and, and when I had to practice. Uh, but mainly just get away and, and do my own thing and have a sort of have a sort of another life away from Sheffield when I'm not playing. And uh, it certainly worked for me, you know. It certainly sort of helped ease the pressure. Although although the, the butterflies were still there and they were flying around all inside me, they they were sort of when I was getting away from Sheffield they weren't so they weren't there as much, you know, and, and I think that's what you, that's what you have to do when you're up there. Now you're playing Elaine Robidoux in the semi-finals, mm. but according to the seedings, uh, it might have been expected that you'd be playing Peter Ebden or Alan McManus, or higher-ranked players, and one of those would have been expected to come through that quarter. Mm. Did this add to the pressure because you were expected to win? I was very confident going into the game because I, I'd, I'd beaten Elaine a couple of times during the season as well. Uh, but certainly, I knew Elaine was playing well, and, and I knew that I was a major favourite to, to win the match. Uh, but sometimes that can be a, a terrible stumbling block if you allow it to, to, to happen. Like when I went out there, when it was just the one table, I got wow, you know, this is this is what it's all about, you know. And, you, and your, your chair is like miles away from the table. You need to, you need to call a taxi, you know, to to, to, to take a shot. But uh, you know, it was it was an incredible difference from the two tables uh, to playing the one tables. And I think the boat was uh, it took us eight frames. To, to sort of relax and get into the match. The semi-finals are best of 33 spread over four sessions. The first finished four all. Doherty won the first two frames of the second session though and he's threatening to pull away. One. I could open it and plenty of reds available. Three. Four. He's having a good look at the red next to the black, and as we can see there, it is available into that corner pocket but he may be just a little bit short I'm not sure if he can get through maybe there's just enough room past the other red and as our camera comes round I think it'll show you that he can just get through to it Ten. <coughs> Eleven. Eighteen. It'll be very 19. interesting to see how Ken Doherty performs now that he's opened up that two frame lead. 20. Well, then knows that uh, his opponent could suddenly 26. grow in confidence and pull away from him. 27. <laughs> This one uh, turns out right. That could be a big break in the offing. Five. 
25. Could have been nicer on the black, but you'd still expect Ken to knock this in. It's just the position outside of this uh, shot becomes a bit more difficult. A little nudge in the red will have uh, helped the situation there for him. 42. He can sneak the one into the middle pocket. Had it have ran on a little bit further, it wouldn't have been available. He's still got quite a bit to do with the cue ball. Forty-three. Obviously didn't want the kiss like that and uh, now faced with a tough shot. He's left a red over this corner. But uh, he's now looking to be in very good form and uh, the blue isn't extremely difficult. It's a little bit awkward queuing over that red. But it could be a frame winner, Dennis. Yes, is the other way of looking at it. It could be a, a frame loser. And he's debating whether just to push the black safe and uh, leave the white tight on the top cushion here. Forty-three, Ken Doherty. said Ali Robidoux, a bit of a poser here. And Alain's in a bit of a difficult position. He's not able to keep Ken out. And uh, very difficult for him to get a good scoring opportunity. He's uh, going to have to try and work something out. wants a better one to get to a red. Ah, that's a good shot. Eight. Nine. Looks as if Elaine can pop the black and avoid the pink, but he could do with the cannon on to the left of the three reds. He's just looking to see if there's any of them available, but a little cannon would stop the white. It was a cracking 16. red that he started this effort with into the middle pocket, although it has to be said that Ken Doherty shouldn't really have left the cue ball off the cushion. He wouldn't have been able to have played that shot, Elaine. Seventeen. Twenty-four. Twenty-five. 
25. As you can see, he's got two easy reds. 32. But there are two rather difficult ones on the right side of the table. It didn't Start get into three. that. That was a poor positional shot from Elaine. He's now got to work hard with the cue ball, avoiding the yellow and the brown. <laughs> Just wondering if he... Well, let's just see how he goes about this. Negotiated those cross colors very well. Tough to eight. But now the tough part starts. Thirty-nine. Anything but uh, absolutely straight. Although he can still just take the cue ball through and finish. forced the angle to get close to that red. I was going to say he could finish on that red, but being 12 or 14 inches nearer 44. makes it that much easier. And this really is the kind of reply that Ale was needing. Well, 44, Lynn Robidoux. He should have potted it, but uh, it could have gone anywhere but there. Uh, Ken's just looking at the angle. He wants to leave himself on the blue. But I think that's a much Watch. better option to get to the red. But he may have overran that. He wanted to leave an angle on the green so as he could screw up to that final red. But he may have just gone a little bit too far. Needs to get a lot of screw on this one. Yeah, he couldn't quite do it. Now, is he going to take the double on or... Four. Get in behind the pink and black with the cue ball. easy double or one that you can be reasonably sure of. That was probably it. Slightly easier to uh, judge the angle with the red bean off the cushion. And Ali Robidoux having to sit there and wonder whether that last missed red is going to cost him the third frame of this morning. Slight nudge on the brown Ten. wasn't played, but it shouldn't be too uh, too expensive for Kent. Twelve. green, brown and blue so he needs to uh, play this with a little bit of power screw and into the back cushion bounce off of the brown 15 yes I think what he was doing was just settling himself there he knew that that was the uh, vital shot Nineteen. 
Starting to look good. Can the hardy. And this isn't the start that Hilaire do wanted. Extended his winning streak to five frames as he went from four all to nine four. Robbie Dew never looked like recovering, and Doherty polished him off 17 7 with a session to spare. A lot easier than you thought, Ken. Yeah, well, after the first session, I said, like, you know, the boat was just fine on their feet, but in, in the evening time, uh, the next session, I, I felt very, very relaxed. And, uh, you know, was because I'd settled in, I, I realised what I, what I was witnessing and uh, what it was all about. And I, I played, I started to play the snooker that I can play. And, and as you said, I, I, I reeled off five frames in a row, and and everything from then on was was like uh, was pretty plain sailing, really. You know, once I established a nice lead, I, I could relax a little bit more and sort of exert a little bit more pressure on the lane. I knew this was a big opportunity for me. I certainly wasn't happy just just to get to the final. Now, I, although I, I'd experienced all those lovely things during coming up to the final, now I'd sort of realised this was my chance, you know. I, I knew Stephen had been there many times before and, uh, you know, it was like water off a duck's back to him. It was. It certainly wasn't that to me, but I knew this was my chance. I wasn't going to uh, just get to the final and then just, you know, lie down and say, well, at least I've done pretty well. I knew this was my chance and chances like them don't come along very often. So, I wanted to put as much effort into the final as you know of all the matches that have gone before me together all together you know and uh, um, just to get away and, and be focused and, and knew exactly what my game plan was and, and I wanted to try and stick to that and uh, with the session to spare I had a bit more extra time uh, a lot more time than Stephen had and it certainly worked to my advantage in, in the final. Hendry had won the world title six times in his last seven attempts. He hadn't lost at the Crucible since the 1991 quarter-final. He'd had a very good season, even by his standards, winning five events and being in at the business end of most of the others. On top of that, he'd had a tougher road to the final than he'd ever had before. Andy Hicks, 10-6, Mark Williams, 13-8, Darren Morgan, 13-10 and James Wattenaar, 17-13. The final is best of 35 over four sessions and the first was pretty unusual. Hendry made three centuries, but Doherty was more consistent and led 5-3. Early in the second session, it was 6-4. Here's the conclusion to the 11th frame. Well, I'm sure Steve was trying to leave an angle on the red there to bring the other red into play, so now we'll try and do it with the pink on this red behind the black. Yes, he didn't have the angle for that one, but now faced with the very tricky pot down the cushion. Stephen Hendry, 45. So a 30-point lead. It was never going to be easy to uh, get a frame-winning break there.
Let's see, can take this one on into the left corner. Had a little bit of luck. Bad shot to kiss the blue. But no pot left. Even a little fortunate there with the, the double kiss. Could have gone anywhere. shot there has made Stephen a better favourite now for this frame put in the yellow and blue tight this the cue ball's just run down for position on the brown but it's not worth potting it but if he could play a snooker and bring the blue out that's what he'll do and uh, Ten that yeah. is going to be awkward sure that uh, well I was going to say whether he could get between blue and yellow but obviously Stephen thinks he can foul and a miss for Ken Doherty and this is going to be very awkward for Stephen to get very close but it may well be that uh, he hasn't the angle off that left hand side cushion on the evidence of the first shot, I don't think he has. Alan Chamberlain there, first time referee in an Embassy World Championship final. Having to be very precise where he put the cue ball then. A foul, four, and a free ball. Ken yes, Dock. and that is the vital part a free ball so Ken can name any color which counts as an extra red blue ball Yes, and the perfect angle One. still on the blue to come down for this last red. The 
chapter 6. So this could well be the all-important shot. Seven. Stephen left in a nigh impossible position by that snooker from Kent. Didn't remarkably well to get that close, but uh, the free ball situation has led to this. Yes, and I think Kent's trying to be a bit too precise here. Looks of the blue, perfect angle to go down for the yellow. And of course, the the tough shot's going to be brown to blue. Seventeen. Well, made sure he had the angle. Doesn't have to force the brown, just drop it in. And it'll be perfect on the blue into the right centre. So just concentrating on the pot. Ken Doherty, 17. Well, they're never the easiest of pots when Four. they're when you're playing them back towards the pocket. Stephen Nine. still wants the pink to make absolutely sure. Well, we're early into Nine. this final, but... Stephen Henry. There are signs that uh, Stephen Henry isn't quite as comfortable you, as he normally is in this Thank arena. You. Don't expect him to miss shots like that to win a frame. Yes, two unexpected shots there. Of course, Ken can only tie with the pink and black. is because this shot has put Ken in quite a quandary. He can hit the pink direct, may go in off it, and if he comes off the cushion, almost certainly the pink will stay where it is and uh, leave his opponent a chance. So needs a bit of luck here. Better shot than that.
game very close. So pink and black to tie. Try number three then to take this frame. from the crowd for what they perceive as the Thank underdog. You. spot the black toss of the coin and Stephen Hendry has had three chances to win this frame already will he get another one tail is ahead sir you've won the toss yeah well I'm not surprised if Ken's won the toss put your opponent in Looks like it might be a double. No, just trying to push the black on the side cushion. <laughs> and this is a vital frame now because both players have had two or three chances to win it. incredible frame I think it's one of the most incredible frames I've ever played in uh, especially like in the final of the world championship Stephen Hendry had I think three chances on that ping re relatively easy chances and I'm sure if uh, you know any of the club players were watching out, out there watching the final I mean that they, they would have been pretty confident of, of knocking it in and uh, certainly I, I, I couldn't believe what I, I was watching that he, he, he missed the, the, the ping three times and, and sort of Although I still had a little bit of work to do, you know, to win that frame was was a, a major sort of stepping stone for me. I re that was the time I think I realised that, you know, this is this is really here for the taking, you know. And if I can get three three or four frames up, you know, in this final, you know, he, he's going to have a, a a tough job in his hands, you know. And uh, to win to win the frame like I did, to to, to knock in the pink and black, and then to uh, to double the black into the corner pocket. I knew I, the funny thing was on, on the. On the respot of black, I said, like, uh, when he played that, it, the, the containing safety shot and knocked it to the side cushion rather than up and down, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to go for this. This, this, is, this is my opportunity. If I don't, like, have a crack at this and, and he gets in and, and, you know, wins it off a bad safety shot by me, you know, I'll be kicking myself, you know. I, I thought, you know, my luck was in. He, he missed the pink three times. I thought, you know, this has to be my friend, you know, and, and that's why I went for, for the double on the black, you know. And I, I couldn't believe it. And the chair, you know, you could you could hear the roar and all the way back to Dublin, you know, when when the, when the black went in. But it was absolutely incredible. Actually, the funny story was that the both of us went out to the toilet straight after that frame, and uh, uh, we were in the toilet there together. And he, and he said to me, he says, "I knew that black was going to go in." You know, it was a funny thing. It was an incredible thing to say to me, you know. But I said, "Well, I, you know, I had to go for it," you know. But he said he knew it was going to go in the minute he, the minute I was looking at it. Doherty increased that three-frame lead to five at 9-4. It sounds a lot, but with three frames still to play on the first evening of the final, Hendry could reduce this to 9-7 overnight and put plenty of doubt in Doherty's mind. Here's the first of those three frames. Lucky not to go in off from a poor break-off shot.
one. Next to the black is available. There's a couple of other reds also on. Ten. Eleven. Twenty-six. Twenty-seven. Thirty-four. Thirty-five. Uh, very unlucky. 42. And this is a pressure pot coming up red to the right corner. This will test this cue action. Suddenly, it's like the old Stephen Hendry. 50. 50. Stephen Hendry, 50. But that wasn't the old Stephen Hendry. Made 50 beautifully, and then missed an easy one. And he's missed too many easy ones today. Sixteen. <clears throat> Seventeen. <clears throat> Twenty-two. And once he takes this red on, it will open the other three up nicely. 23. So there's just that one <laughs> difficult red near the right side cushion. 30. 
31. Thirty-eight. Andrew wondering how on earth he can miss so many easy balls. Thirty-nine. He won't be taking it this time, but he's brought the difficult red into play. Forty-five. A little bit too far for the blue, but he has got the green available. It just depends how he feels. He's just going to drop the blue in, so he's got to make sure that he gets past the red again. 50. <coughs> he's left a rest shot rather than the one with the hand bridge that he would prefer. Yes, and what Ken's looking at there, he's looking to see if the yellow will pass the brown, so he's away three shots ahead. Well, that's what Ken was looking at. It looks as if it's available. Fifty-eight. He's left himself in a good position, close and straight. If it does go... Great chance now to go six frames clear. He's a little bit short with his position. Okay. Uh, got quite a bit of work to do now. Yes, he was concentrating on not missing the green and just didn't hit the cue ball hard enough. Cutting it slowly across almost the full width of the table. <laughs> 72. Hendry led 50 nil. Mr. Simple Red 